you for that uh, great introduction. And it's always surprising, you know, when people present you formally, you know, and say, oh my God, did I do it all that? <laughs> Must be very old. <laughs> Uh, thank you for hosting me here. I came and I said, oh my, this is like the United Nations war zone, you know, war room. <laughs> and uh, we're going to have like virtual screens all over the place, buttons, lights. Uh, uh, but no, I'm alone here. So <laughs> um, I have to thank uh, Dr. Sell and uh, Kim for uh, inviting me to, to seminar. Uh, our technicians that have prepared the video feed and the uh, presentation and all that. Thank you so much. I have to thank also UPLP, the College of Development Communication, who uh, host me as a visiting professor for uh, January, February. And uh, yeah, here I am. Uh, I've been uh, here, been working cell for what six, seven years with the college, huh? uh, nine years ago, and uh, we. We were involved uh, a lot in participatory development communication, mostly in natural resource management. And uh, it was quite interesting. It was a, a great professional time because uh, we use a methodology to tackle uh, concrete problems, but we learned from the concrete problems how to improve our learning on how we do that. So it, doing that was already participatory action research, you know, when you invest what you know in doing something, then you realize you don't know much, and then you learn from what you're doing, you input it again in what uh, you uh, conceptualize, and then you go that way. So I'm going to try to talk to you uh, this afternoon a bit about uh, participatory development communication. I'll frame it a little bit differently than in the seminars that I give at the, the CDC. Uh, I'll try to insist on uh, the approach, but also links on policy making. Uh, because I know that at Sierra you're quite involved in that. So I'll share with you what uh, are my experience in that area. So, uh, to begin with, I have a question for you. What do you see? What? Yeah, exactly. What else? Okay, another question. What don't? What is not in the picture? There's no water. That's true. People. There's no people. You know, when uh, I was working in natural resource management in research development research for uh, 16 years at IRC, and this is what we saw most of the time. And today, as a consultant working in agriculture project and forestry project, I also see the same thing again and again. Which is, basically, you focus on a problem, technical problem. This one was a problem of soil productivity. Uh, but you don't, fo you don't uh, focus on the people that experience that problem or live there. You just see the technical problem. Then, you say, okay, we have a technology that we developed and we validated it, and if you apply it, you're going to have that result, right? No, it doesn't work. But still we work, most of development project in agriculture still works that way. So the catch is that, uh, you know, people are paid to participate in those projects, but when the project is finished and they're not paid to do so, then there's nothing much left of the original project. So, can I ask you what you're seeing in that picture? Do you, something that catch your attention in the, in the picture? Yeah. What? Oh yes, they're so bored. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Look, <laughs> Miss here is having a little nap, little afternoon nap, you know? And those guys are looking elsewhere. <laughs> And the young guy there, who's the representative of youth, is asking himself what the what hell he's doing there, you know? And this picture tells a lot, because this is a real community meeting, and I took the photograph myself, because it shows exactly what happened when you say, oh, farmers participate. They are participated, you mean. They don't participate because this is not their own business. This is the business of the project, and they are paid to participate in it. You'll be sure that after, when it's over, it's finished. 
Uh, I was in the, I told that story in another seminar, but I'll tell it again. Um, I was with a group of researchers and visiting a, uh, a project in which uh, there was an agricultural innovation. It's called Living Fences. And the principle is, is really easy. It's because you work in a very dry land. Uh, and and the, the, the soil, the productive soil is very, very thin. And the wind swept it. And after a time, it doesn't produce anything more because there's no productive soil anymore, right? And so the idea is that uh, if you plant that type of shrub and it grows, then it protects the plot, and then you can have like retain the humidity in the soil, and then you can grow something, right? And uh, it's very adaptive because it's easy, it's natural, there's, there's, it's not commercial, it's organic, etc. So we were, I think, 20 researchers, and uh, were invited to uh, to visit, and there were two farmers, and we were there for an hour, an hour and a half, and the two farmer explained to us how it worked. So. Uh, all the genesis of the technique, how you start, how to maintain, what are the results. Perfect. So we're very much impressed, you know, and after that, uh, we thank them and uh, we go back to the cars and this is a big success. Um, but I, I tag along, you know, but I stay, uh, I stay there a bit before joining the group and I start talking to the farmers and I said, oh wow, that's interesting. I mean, it, it must have changed a lot, you know, for your own plots. And he said, what do you mean? said, well, when you apply that technique, you know, with your plots, now you have more food to it for your family. He said, are you crazy? We don't do that. That's much too much work. And this is a true story, you know. So, I mean, the, the thing is, you know, the real story, because this is not their own problem. This is not the technology they choose. This is not what they want to do. They're doing it because it's work like any other work. Makes sense, right? But it also denotes that we have to change our way of approaching development in agriculture if we want some impact after a given project has ended. And this is basically uh, the, uh, what we mean with participatory development communication. Uh, there's three concepts in that approach. Uh, participatory communication, participatory action research, and participatory development. And, you know, it's, it's again, it's, it's learning, investing what you know into uh, concrete action, concrete development initiative, then, you know, learning from what you're doing, reinvesting that, that experience into knowledge, and then using that new knowledge again as you go along to work in development. And this is, is really uh, what is uh, about, about participatory action research and participatory communication mixed together. So, very briefly, because uh, this is not a class, but I want to share more experiences with you, but very briefly, the first concept of participatory communication is mostly about moving from information dissemination to including people in uh, the decision-making about the development problem that they experience and that they want to find a solution with. So, for example, if I go back to the first photograph I show you, this is information dissemination. I choose a, pro a problem, then I want to convey the solution to that problem. Okay? This was what development communication was doing at, at the real, real beginning of the, what they call the paradigm, the paradigm of uh, information uh, dis dissemination of innovation. Uh, but this, you know, as I explained, is very short-lived. So it doesn't go very far. For, so for us, if we want to act with knowledge, with learning, with information, we have to move from transmitting information and have people really get involved in the identification of the problem, the way they define it, the possible solution to it, and also a very concrete decision to try something to tackle the problem themselves. Now you can bring the expert. You can be the facilitators. You can be, bring all the other uh, stakeholders that are involved around that. But the lead is in the community. is no longer with the project team. What's better reaction research? The second concept in PDC. Uh, it's really what I explained. Uh, the, the research is based on a problem that is identified by the community. And learning it is always reinvested in action. It's that cycle I was talking about. 
and social and adaptive learning is our third concept. And this concept is that we people learn more uh, through sharing of experience with other people who are experiencing similar things. So if we have, for example, um, a uh, community members, researchers, other stakeholders that get together and share what they learn, this kind of social and adaptive learning, this connective process of learning, is very efficient, very, very effective, because the, learn, the different perspectives are shared. Often we think of learning as content. Uh, content is just one part of learning. Learning is much more the experiential and inner experience of interacting with the content or the lack of content. So this is our third concept and we work with uh, which we work. Uh, the, uh, the project that Kim was mentioning before, uh, all in CBNRM, and which was uh, uh, led by Dr. Katsis some years ago, was all about uh, that adaptive and social learning applied to try to solve development uh, problems in the field of NRM, natural resource management, and learning from what we're doing. PDC strategy. Okay, so those are the concepts. The strategy, how does it work? Uh, so it's a planned process. This is a, there's a series of steps that we can follow in a very systematic way to go towards that. Uh, but mostly it's about two things. The first thing is about involving the local community in the identification of the problem, the possible solution, and also the decision to do something about it. So it's not about telling them, okay, this is what we're going to do to solve the problems of soul productivity. It's more like, okay, um, what, what issue do you have with the soil? And uh, maybe they don't have any. Uh, and uh, what do you think happens and why? And engaging them in the discussion. And then we can bring experts uh, in the discussion uh, to try to have a dialogue more, fun, more based on evidence. But the first step is more with the local community, not starting with the expert. Experts come in the second step. Uh, the second aspect of the PDC strategy is yes, using a communication strategy to support that process. So basically what we do is that we start a community process where uh, there's a decision taken to tackle a specific development problem. Okay? And then we develop with the community a strategy, a communication strategy to support that process. So it's about four types of, uh, of things. It's about uh, knowledge, it's about attitudes, uh, it's about practices, and it can be about skills. This is the job of communication. Communication doesn't deal with, I need some credit facility. Sorry, go see the bank. Communication cannot help you except of maybe linking you with some key people, but it's not a problem. Communication is not how you can solve, you know, your kid who is sick. Uh, that's medical doctor type of thing, it's not communication. We have to be clear what communication can or cannot do. What it can do, those four things, very well. So this, this is the BDC uh, strategy uh, approach. Uh, and those, those steps, um, you can group it in four phases. Uh, the first one is try to understand what's happening and develop a relationship with the community. The second and the third are formulating and developing your strategy. The fourth one is to validate that with the community and get organized to really get into action. So I won't go very in depth like I did in the, in the seminar for graduate students. If you are interested in, in more details, uh, you can see me after and I can give you a reference or we can meet afterward. I'm at the college uh, until the end of the month. So if some people are interested to discuss, uh, I'm available, just let me know. But, you know, very briefly, uh, the first phase, uh, you know, if there's two things to remember about it, is that if you don't develop a relationship with the community, it's very difficult to have a dialogue going on. You know, because we arrive in a community, even if you're, I'm not talking about a white guy coming in a, in a community of another country, but even you, you come from the city, you come in a 4x4, in a four four, you arrive to a village, 
and people see you as big shots. You know, even if you're, a, you know, a young graduate student, and, uh, you know, they see you as a big shot. They see you as someone who has power. You have the four by four. You know, good clothes, good clothing. You speak well. You're educated. You know, people don't know how to react. You will have to establish that knowledge or work with an organization who has been working with that community for many years. But you cannot just decide one day, okay, we're going to that community and we're going to work because we have been hired by that project to do so. It won't work. Uh, you can see the difference when you see organizations that have been working with communities for 10 years when they work development issues and compare that to other situations that you may have seen. So that's the first thing. The, only, the, the second thing I would like um, want to emphasize is what I call setting the goal with the community. Uh, what's the goal of the intervention? This is important because usually you are hired by a NGO, uh, development project, uh, maybe a decentralized extension office, uh, other, other organization who have probably some project with a definite budget and a definite timeline to hire you. So if this is the case, usually the goal is already, already defined, the objectives are already set. But you know that it won't work if, you, if it stays that way. So your job as PDCers, as communicators using that participatory approach, is to frame, to frame that problem defined in a way by the project, in a way that makes sense for the community. So maybe the goal of the project is to try to uh, facilitate community-based natural resource management. And all the project is structured around that. But maybe, you know, for the community, their point of view is just to improve the livelihood. So which way will you take it? Will you take it by the window of the project or will you take it by the window of the community? What do you say? Which will you choose? Community for one. Okay, well, you're right, and, 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 and also, we also have to link with the project, because if not, you will not, not have a job the week after, right? <laughs> so, no, but this is tricky. It's, 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 it seems very simple, but it's very tricky. Is that this is a, a very important task trying to go from the point of view of the project to the point of view of the community, framing it in that way, and then explaining at the project, to the project people, what is happening, why we are framing it differently while staying in the, 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 the same intention. So that's our job. So there's a lot of things to do before actually doing any communication strategy. This, you are a communication actor the moment that you interact with the community. You're a communication actor, and you're supposed to facilitate that process. This is your main job. Um, often people work with local community, uh, but you know there's not such thing as a local community, as a homogeneous group, right? So often people work with the men and the women and the youth. But really there's no such thing as the woman, the man, and the youth. You know? I've been in uh, community meetings where they say, oh, okay, uh, here are the women, here are the, the youth, you know. But all the women, you know, were all chosen because they were chosen by the elite of the community. Uh, the farmer women were too busy working in the field to be part of that meeting. You know? And because you're from the outside, you don't know. So the youth, the same thing. Who are those people? You know? And another thing that we have to take in mind is that depending on the problem that has been identified by the community, we have different group of stakeholders. Uh, you know, if you if we work with uh, you know introducing new livelihood in the community to support the agriculture work, for example, we we'll want to import some. Uh, the community will want to try some beekeeping. Well, you, you have a group interested in beekeeping, right? Uh, another one wants to develop some potential for medicinal plants. You have that group as well. Uh, you have the, the poor farmers and you have the farmers who are near the elite of the community. Those are two different groups with two different sets of needs, right? So there's a reflection 
to try to identify who are the specific groups with specific needs. And our job as development communicator with that kind of approach will be to identify what do they need to really do uh, the initiative that they decide they will do. Okay? So, again, I won't go very in depth in this, but I just want you to have a sense that before going into formulating a communication strategy, as such, there's a lot of work to do. Um, then we go to the, all the technique, you know, that you know very well, the objective, the message, content, the tools, and we, you know, develop the strategy further, you know. I won't go into that today. Um, the last thing is what has been developed must be validated with the community, and then we need a, a kind of implementation plan. Um, there's something like 16 steps. Sometimes, you know, when I'm tired, they're, they become 18 steps. <laughs> so, it depends on the day. But the thing is, you know, it's a, it's a process. And why is it important to do that instead of just barging around, you know, uh, and arriving with the project in the community? It's because it helps us not to make too many mistakes. So, this is an example um, of, a, of a project in which the project itself wanted to tackle soil productivity issue and it started with the extension services of the country trying to do a lot of workshop on agricultural technique. Uh, but in a given region, uh, there, were, there weren't that any, any success because they have not taken the time to do their own work and to know that this was the, for that particular culture, that was the job of the woman, not of the men. So doing the workshop to the men don't help a lot, right? So they asked El to continue to do that kind of work and uh, we thought of using uh, a mix of theater and local radio and community meetings to work on that kind of extension work. But because we did our own work, uh, because we did those steps, we understood that there's no problem of soil productivity because those women who are cultivating they know those techniques very well. So why, are not, why aren't they using them? That was a big question, you know? And the answer was quite simple. The answer was that if they applied those techniques that they knew, and they had a very good productivity out of their plot of land, the plot of land would be taken from them and reinvested in the community plots of land. Because this is good land, you know? It's not land for women. Uh, and, and, and this was a big shock, you know, for people because often, like I said, people don't take the time to do that kind of research. They go to the implementation phase. They, they, we do a lot of mistakes. So learning that the real problem was not exactly soil productivity techniques to be learned, but was a, a, a problem of how do we act on a situation where, you know, their land will be taken from them if they have a good productivity. This is crazy. Yeah, this is totally crazy. You know, in school, it, something, you're punished if you do something bad. Now you're punished if you do something good. <laughs> so, we, so we applied that technique and we asked the women and said, well, you know, uh, what, do you, what do you think? What could we use? And there was a lot of discussions. And uh, then the women came with, a, they came with an idea themselves. They say, well, you know, there's a ritual, there's a tradition. Once a year in our community, just once a year for 24 hours, Women dress as men, and for 24 hours they can do exactly everything they want to do, and there's no retaliation whatsoever. So it's a kind of a carnival, uh, if you want, and uh, and it has been done for generations. You want to try this? Thing? <laughs> so we decided to to use that traditional ritual in the participatory theater. So, in fact, the woman dressed at, as men and it illustrated the situation that was happening to them. And then and we, the play was in the middle of the village. All the community was there, all the elite was there. And, you know, although it was taboo, and this could not have been talked about in any community meeting, in that setting, with that particular technique, it could be illustrated. And after that, 
there was a commitment from the, um, the, uh, the elite of the community that this will stop right now. And that uh, women could have as much productivity as they want. There was an engagement, a formal a promise uh, that then will not be taken from them again. The nice thing about that is that up to two years after that, villages around came and see the women, ask them how they do that and how would they implement that in the community and ask the participatory theater group to go there and th there was a regional effect to that. So, this is why we have that very long process of steps to try to get to the real root of the problem through involving the community and themselves identifying them and us, we do the link with the project structure. Um, I have other stories, but uh, it's a bit far. Maybe I'll, I'll skip that one. Um, <coughs> Dr. Sell asked me to talk about policy a little bit, so, so I'll share some of my thoughts on policy issues and agriculture. Um, Okay, those are not systematic, okay, it's not, uh, it's just my own thoughts of having been involved in policy issue. The first thing is access to information that came to my mind, uh, because uh, for the last few years I've been involved in uh, two African countries in the implementation of the International Plan Treaty. Uh, for those who are knowledgeable of that treaty, it's about phytogenetical resources, <laughs> and I can assure you that in those two countries, if there were six people who knew what an international plan treaty on phytogenetical resources for food and agriculture meant was good. Could you repeat after me? <laughs> you see? And, and those people were researchers that were at the Ministry of Scientific Research. Uh, there was a few of them uh, at the National Seed Service uh, and one director of, of agricultural extension uh, apart from that, uh, yeah, some people knew about phytogenetical resources. Most people don't know what you're talking about, talking about genes. What genes of plants and what, does, what does that have to do with us, you know, and all that. And, and that was the first thing. If you want to implement something like that, people must know what you're talking about. And you must try to convey it in very simple words, but also in a context that makes sense for people. And then you have the issue of languages and level of understanding. Uh, there was no initiative taken to communicate in simple way what are phytogenetical resources, what an international treaty to, to uh, protect them, why is it important. There was nothing in place. Um, but we, uh, in, in what we did, we start putting things in place. We work with different categories of stakeholders, you know, farmers and uh, extension people and uh, also policy makers and researchers. And for each one, uh, we develop with them a way of explaining what we mean. And uh, we use national language for the, the, with the farmers and we use also different tools uh, for the different public. For example, we use rural radio in national language uh, in plus community meeting to talk about that with farmers and, and farmer association. We use workshop, uh, but for researcher we use more formal meeting, and uh, for policymaker we use TV because what doesn't show on TV is not really important. Uh, so for each category of stakeholder, there's a different level of language and there's a different tool that you must use, channel if you want, to get reach to them. Okay, so what's the, the, the catch here? Help me, what's the catch in what I just told you? Okay, it's written there. Uh, that's what I call the against the type factor. <coughs> you know, when we talk about it, it makes a lot of sense. The problem is that it's not planned in any project. There's no budget line. And there's no champion to advocate for that. So, you have like those big policy and agriculture projects. No one knows what you're talking about, but there's nothing planned to really give access to that information to the key stakeholders that will be involved or concerned by that uh, policy. And this is the problem that we have in policy making. 
this is about information. Let me let me go on. Information is is just one side of the story. Now the other side of the story is communication. So the information, the difference with information and communication is we communicate. You know, it's an interaction. Uh, so how do you open that policy dialogue to to everyone? And, and, and again, that's not easy because the same catch, uh, it's not planned in any project, there's no budget line, and there's no champion who says, oh wow, you know, we have to open the policy floor to people, to different organizations, and we have to put the preconceived ideas on the table and discuss them in the open. Oh, I give you an example. So I went to see one of the national uh, farm organizations. There, there's a lot there's a, in that particular country where I was working. Uh, it was in Burkina Faso. There must be like more than hundreds of farm organizations. So there's not one or two. But there's what they call the, the, the umbrella organization. There's more. There's two big national umbrella organizations. So went to see the first one. And so I say, okay, we want to. Um, to uh, enlist, you know, your, enlist your collaboration and we want to reach to farmers and community and we want to discuss with you how best we could do that and it's about the treaty on phytogenetical resources for food and food security and agriculture and they say, oh no, 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 you think we know where you're coming from this treaty coming from outside, that's a plan to introduce GMO and our position as an umbrella organization, farm organization is clear, we don't want any GMO here. So we're not interested in the treaty and we're not interested in helping. That was very interesting because now if you want to discuss with those guys, you have to put that on the table saying, okay, this is the GMO thing, this is the phytogenetical uh, resources aspect and this is where they interact, and this is where we're talking about two different things. So if you don't do that, even if you give information, those people will always stick in their head, no, no, you're trying to sell us something that we don't want. I went to another umbrella organization, farm organization, and they said, ha ha, no, no, your thing we see you coming, huh? You want to sell us, you know, improved varieties. Uh, we don't want improved varieties, you know. Our mission to represent our farmers is really to protect and preserve and promote the traditional varieties that always have been on our, on our land. So the same thing, if you don't know that those guys think that, and those guys means many thousand and thousand and ten of thousands of farmers, right? They're our bread organization. If you don't know what they think, if you don't put that on the open, then you will not go very far. Again, the catch. No budget line, no one to say, okay, mister, it's important that you put that in your project, you know, open the dialogue to the different stakeholders, stretch your timeline because it's going to take at least a few years to try to reach with, for, with everyone in the country, but it's so important. Another thing, I, I don't know what, how to call it, I call it the visibility danger. So, in that same project, uh, we have different workshops uh, organized with different categories of stakeholders. Uh, like I said, farmers and representatives of private sectors and association and community. And then we have the researchers and then we have the policy makers. And uh, the policy maker one, uh, we, didn't, we didn't think that true. But uh, what happened is that it was very successful. And because it was with policymaker, of course, you have national television, national radio, national press, everyone was there. And uh, they went to the coordinator of the national organization that's in charge of that project of phytogenetical resources and interview him. And, you know, it was on the first page, it was on the prime time on TV. It was a huge success. No, it was not the huge success. That was the worst thing that might happen. Why? Well, the minister got mad. And he said that he should be the one on TV. He should be the one on the press, not the coordinator of his national commission. So out he goes. The guy lost his job. 
and all our efforts were bang, you know, hit, hit the road. We have to, so, so that's considerations that are not in the textbook and that people don't think about. Even us, we didn't think about that at all. Uh, when you work with policymakers, you work with government officials, it's very sensitive, very, very sensitive. So that's another factor. Uh, what else can I share with you on policy uh, in, in agriculture? It's very interesting. Uh, yeah, who needs another policy? We did some, uh, you know, given workshop three years ago. That was another African country. It was in Mali. In Mali. We did uh, the mapping with uh, uh, with people from different horizon uh, working in agriculture. There was over 100 different policies and set of regulation dealing with agriculture in the country. Nothing communicated with the others. No communication between like this and no communication between the formulation and the implementation. So it's like the silo effect. In policy, most government have uh, inherited from the colonization process the silo effect and no one knows what the other is doing and, and this is counterproductive. Too many policy is worse than no policy at all. And no communication between the formulation level and the implementation level is worse than anything at all. You may as well not have anything. Doesn't, you may have all your policy it's stacked there like the reports on the shelf of the library. No one use it. So what? So that's another very important issue, and I, I see this in, in most countries. Um, that's a good one. Um, conflict between different government departments, such as agriculture and environment. Uh, I don't know if you, if you face that kind of stuff, but uh, I can tell you it happens every day. Um, in another country, in another African country, we, uh, we work on the with many stakeholders on developing a draft, a draft law uh, to protect the phytogenetical resources of the country and have the law uh, go to parliament. And uh, we had those workshops, you know, many workshops, uh, not one, many workshops of discussion, then lawyers <coughs> systematizing the knowledge, and then the draft law, and then looking at our, every article and all that, perfect. And then we had all those meetings with, you know, the director of uh, agriculture and then the, the, the minister and blah blah blah. But the thing is, in the context of that specific project, and it, it may be the same thing in other topics, but in that specific thing, there's another international treaty. That's called, you know, the national the international treaty for biodiversity. And there's a protocol called the Nagoya Protocol who also have a set of international rules that give some rules to follow when you deal with phytogenetical resource or other genetical resources because it's all over, it's all biodiversity. So the two are different but the two intersect. And the two are, are championed by two different ministries, agriculture and environment. And everyone wants to have the lead and they will do whatever it needs to stop the process if it goes in the other direction. In that specific example, uh, the draft law was stopped dead at, uh, before going to the minister because the uh, minister didn't, take the, uh, didn't want to take the chance to have his reputation destroyed by the other minister of the environment who would come with his own thing. And we had to find another, another entry point uh, to, to continue the work. And that's also part of policy making. You really have to to look at the DNA and see what you can do. So we went by the door of the, the Science Commission of the Parliamentarian, who were open to that, and we could short-circuit the, uh, the ministry hierarchy your, your that way and continue with the process. But just to say that this is something that you will encounter often and must be aware of that. It can really destroy any process. Um, okay, I can go on and on and rabble and rabble. I think I'm, I'm going to stop there, folks, uh, and more of like questions or things like that. I'm, I'm only do giving all this because Dr. Sell said, okay, don't forget me, please talk about policy making. Uh, PDC, that's okay, but please talk about policy making. So there you are, Sell. So thank you, everyone, for your patience and. Uh,